Tonight on the Donlin Report, the Trump Organization charged with tax fraud. Prosecutors calling the crime sweeping and audacious. The company's finance chief in the spotlight is the former president connected. In Surfside, after a pause today for safety reasons, the search for survivors continues as President Biden visits the site of the condo collapse. The whole nation is mourning with these families. They see it every day on television. They're going through hell. Also, college athletes can now get paid. I'll speak with the very first student athlete signing on the dotted line at midnight about his new endorsement deal. The Donla Report starts right now. Good evening. Great to have you with us. There were reports this was coming, and today it did. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has brought charges against the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg. Prosecutors called it a sweeping and audacious 15-year tax scheme. According to the indictment unsealed today, the Trump Organization and its CFO cheated the city and state out of taxes tied to payments and fringe benefits that were, by intention, kept off the books. Let's get right to News Nation's Leland Vittert with details tonight. Leland? Now, Republicans are already hitting back, saying that this was ABC Widget Corporation, for example. This would have never been charged, and that's an argument the Trump attorneys are making as well. Alan Weisselberg is one of the longest-serving Trump executives, and he was brought in to court today to answer those charges. He pled not guilty, and also, if you take a look at the video of him walking into court, you'll notice lawyers for the Trump Organization itself were also there, and that is because the Trump Organization was charged as well. 15 counts, $1.7 million in perks over 15 years. This is from the indictment. The purpose of the scheme was to compensate Weisselberg and other Trump Organization executives in a manner that was off the books. It continues, the beneficiaries of the scheme received substantial portions of their income through indirect and disguised means. Now, here is the attorneys for the Trump Organization hitting back. I think that it is a, a improper president. Um, I think the office knows this. I'm not saying anything to you all that they are not aware of, but I believe the political forces uh, driving today's events um, are just that. It's uh, political, politically driven. And the charges center around a couple of different perks, specifically the use of leased automobiles, apartments, and possibly tuition for some of Weisselberg's kids, and whether or not that income was declared, whether or not taxes were paid on it. There's been long speculation that Weisselberg was involved in discussions with the Manhattan DA's office and the state attorney general's office about turning state's evidence. Why did he not turn state evidence? Talk to a former assistant United States attorney general about that, and he said, as you read through this, the case is pretty thin, and there may be an assumption that they can beat this, hence the not guilty plea. Joe? Leland, what are we hearing from the former president? I know he released a statement and also other members of the family as well. He talked about it last night. The president did. Eric Trump talked about it as well. And they're echoing two points. Number one is this issue that if this was the ABC Widget Corporation, this would have never happened, saying this is definitely politically motivated. This is what the president had to say earlier. The political witch hunt by the radical left Democrats with New York now taking over the assignment continues. It is dividing our country like never before. Eric Trump made a slightly different argument. After five years, hundreds of subpoenas, three and a half millions of pages of documents, and dozens of witnesses, is this what they have? Also, a number of the president's supporters are making the point that the New York Attorney General ran on the platform of investigating President Trump, saying any investigation by her would be tainted. Going forward, look for Republicans to make the argument about the resources spent on this investigation, the amount of time, the man hours that Eric Trump was talking about, and then tossing out statistics about the crime rate in New York. For example, all the time spent in this investigation versus, say, the shootings of last year, Joe, and still on January 1st of this year, 70% of last year's shootings in New York City had not been solved. Leland, thank you. We're going to get some legal analysis right now from former federal prosecutor Pat Brady, also former head of the Illinois Republican Party. Pat, as we look at this from the grand scheme of things, big picture, this is pretty well laid out and seems to be pretty straightforward, very well detailed. Yeah, I kind of disagree with Leland's uh, prosecutor's assumption. This is a, a weak case. Actually, if you read the indictment, it's in a speaking indictment, and it details out the scheme to get money, compensation, out of the Trump Organization and not pay taxes on it. It's a fairly uh, detailed 
scheme, including there's two sets of books, which to me is like, it's almost, <laughs> it's, that's a, a dream thing for a prosecutor to get that. So I think the case is strong, but what I don't think is, is the potential sentence is enough, given the lack of the loss, and that's where you determine the sentence, to have Weisselberg cooperate. Why would he now? Roll the bones and maybe get four months at, you know, at the club you, fed. You think this gets pled down? I don't think it's pled. I think you go to trial and still the, the range that he's going to be facing is not going to be big enough to incent him to say, hey, I'm going to cooperate and blow up my whole life here at the end of my career. Is there more to this than that? Is... Well, and that's the big question. I think one side of the coin, it's kind of a thud because you had a five and a half year investigation. We got the tax returns four months ago. We, I thought personally this was going to tie more into the Trump dealings in the financial world with the financial institutions and the insurance companies. And we get this kind of silly tax fraud scheme with Weisselberg. It just seemed like a kind of a thud, but I, I but the bigger point, Joe, I don't know where this takes it because it, the, Trump's not named in this indictment as an unindicted co-conspirator. Somebody else is, so it doesn't seem to me they move the ball forward. What does it mean for Donald Trump in particular? He was not named, as you said. Is this an effort, do you think, with Weisselberg being indicted to try to get more? Again, is there more to come on this or not? I think there is more to come, but I'm not sure if there's going to be another indictment of, of Weisselberg. And I've heard some hyperbolic statements about. This is, uh, this is going to be, be a big RICO case. I just don't see it going that way. That being said, it is a bad day for Trump. They indicted the organization, right. which we, means they're going to have to engage. And what does that mean? Well, it potentially could mean that this is an organization built on leverage, and they have these financial institutions that have lended them money to operate their many businesses. They may, at some point, call the loans or not loan them money anymore. What are the political implications here, Pat? Uh, we heard the president say this is a witch hunt. Um, but his personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is actually the one who touched this off, right? Yeah, you think they'd learn the lesson when you have the, the porn star tryst and pay them off that that's not going to be good for business down the road. <laughs> <laughs> you think that the politicians would learn that lesson. If you're going to have an affair, don't cover it up and pay off people. But I guess they don't. But I, I do think politically, th there's kind of two ways to look at this. But I think the way this is going to shake out, this is going to energize Trump supporters who I think can make a fairly credible argument, a Democrat DA indicting, like Leland said, a company that probably never would have even been investigated but for its Donald Trump, a selective prosecution, a.k.a. a witch hunt, against this president because they don't like it. What do you think the tax returns they finally got in this case ultimately meant to this indictment today? It was that was what they needed. to tie. The, I, this has been going on like for five and a half years. They needed this to tie the bow up. You can't do a tax case, which I think are three or four of the counts, uh, filing the uh, fa false filings without having the actual returns. So does the fact that President Trump, the former president, signed these tax returns implicate him at all or no? Uh, not necessarily. I, 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 I haven't seen anything today from what was filed today or even the, the talk around this that would implicate him directly, other than knowing this is a pretty smallly held corporation. And I can't for the life of me believe that he didn't know this compensation was going up. But that's a long way from proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Important, too, to point out, this is the Manhattan DA. Yeah, not this the is, feds. This is a different deal, yeah, right? Yeah, and so I've all day been listening to people talk about, oh, when the feds come knocking, this ain't the feds. This is the DA. They typically don't do sophisticated uh, white-collar type investigation. And, and the, the feds have a whole regulatory framework. They can prosecute bank fraud, insurance fraud, and other tax fraud that's much broader than what the state has. So I'm waiting to see what the Southern District of Manhattan does. Which is what? And where is that stand right now? N nobody knows. You know, and that's the way it should be. These are supposed to be secret proceedings. And we'll find out when they decide if they're going to indict somebody or not. All right. Pat Brady, thank you, as always, for Good your legal here. insight. Appreciate it. Good to see you. College athletes getting paid. Players can now ink endorsement deals in a handful of states. I'll speak with one student athlete who signed on the dotted line at midnight about his new endorsement deal. That's coming up. Also, lawmakers in Washington are now getting involved in the Britney Spears conservatorship saga. Is a free Britney hearing coming to Capitol Hill? And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Well, it's payday for student athletes. Starting today, college players in 10 states can start getting paid for their name, image, and likeness, or NIL laws, as they've become known. They've already been enacted in Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania. And by 2025, you can see the states here, at least 25 more will allow student athletes to profit off their personal brand. It seems like this will be in every state soon enough, because if you don't, you'll be left out. Some players already taking advantage of the new laws with several announcing their deals on social media today. Joining me now is one of those players, 
and the CEO of the company now sponsoring him, University of Miami's quarterback, De'Eric King, and Omar Sullivan of College Hunks Hauling Junk. So, uh, De'Eric, does this mean you're going to be hauling junk? <laughs> I guess so. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or at least you have to at least spend a day on the truck. So as a sponsor and as a spokesman, you can tell people what it's like. Um, Absolutely. Give me an idea of what it was like for you when you signed that deal, Eric, um, at a minute past midnight. Were you thinking about the money or were you thinking about the magnitude of what this meant for college athletes? Um, I think I was definitely thinking about the magnitude. And um, I thought, you know, signing with Kyle Hunt was College Hunk was a perfect fit for me, you know, looking at their core values. I thought it was a good fit. Um, so definitely, you know, doing my research at the company. And uh, it, it was a big moment for everybody in, uh, in college sports. So I was decided to be one of the first. Omar, how long have you been working on this? Uh, you knew this was coming. So take us through your marketing plan and what went into your thinking here. Well, I'll be honest with you. It was 48 hours. Uh, really? We, you know, it was something that we, <laughs> we knew that it was something we were passionate about, but actually doing it at midnight. Uh, was actually the idea of a good buddy of mine, Mike Murphy from Murphy Auto Group, uh, and then also Amon Richards, former Miami Hurricane player, now agent. Uh, and we all kind of sat in a room and said, hey, if we're going to do this, let's be first. And who better to be first and to make history than uh, Derek King, uh, because he's a living, breathing testament to our company's core values. And also just beyond that, he's just a guy that's got a lot of grit. Um, and somebody that people should look up to. Right. So is Murphy Auto Group going to be your next uh, your sponsor, Derek? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I signed, yeah, I signed a deal with those guys as well. You did? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Can you talk about the money? I don't even know. Is this inappropriate? It's. I know your deal with College Hunks was released. You get twenty grand for that, right? Yeah, it was a combined it was, it was deal a with Murphy Auto yeah, and, and College deal. Hunks. Um, and so, yes, it was a combined deal of, of $20,000. $20, um, you know, we don't typically talk about endorsements, but this being the first one right. and sort of a historic one, uh, I think it's it's appropriate. How much was the auto group, Derek? So it was, it was 10 joint, and 10. Uh, oh, yeah. I see. 10 and 10. Okay. Uh, you also, this was interesting, Derek, teamed up with your uh, your counterpart at Florida State to start a new company that sort of deals with these endorsements. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think it's very important, you know, for us to to start having ownership of things, you know. So um, Dreamfield is a really good, really good company uh, that me and Mackenzie, you know, helped build. And then, we, you know, we started a partnership and uh, it's, it's going really well so far. So I'm excited to be a part of Dreamfield and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, help, uh, tell, to help it grow. Tell us a little bit more about how it works. And, and is this an effort in a way for you to try to spread the wealth? Someone who isn't as high profile as you are, maybe athletes who are playing golf or tennis who can also benefit from this new rule? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the main idea when we started talking about, the, you know, the company. Um, it's basically company athletes go sign up and then the business and come to the platform to, you know, find other athletes rather than the, mm -hmm. you know, high profile, you know, starting quarterback or starting basketball player to give those guys, you know, endorsement deals as well. So we're, uh, starting the company, we, we thought about, you know, women's soccer, um, uh, men's golf, um, you know, volleyball teams and things like that mm -hmm. to help everybody, you know, try to capitalize on their name. Omar, a week ago, uh, this would have got you into big trouble and would have gotten the university into big trouble. What does this mean for you as a businessman and a booster? Well, it means a lot. Um, College Hunks was born out of a business plan contest at University of Miami where Derek actually plays, and it was a $10,000 check. Uh, so kind of to go full circle, a week ago, a uh, college athlete wouldn't have been able to take part in the same thing that I did. Um, and I believe that everyone has the right to be an entrepreneur. Um, nobody should prevent anyone from being able to monetize, whether it's their personal brand, their business, um, or whatever else that is that they want to do. Um, so this is extremely exciting. I think it ushers in a new era of entrepreneurship that we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, it's going to connect brands with student athletes, um, and it's going to really just help, I think, raise the bar for everyone, the yeah. athlete, the brand, and the fan. Right. De'Eric, tell me how you think this would have changed your recruiting process had it been in effect when you were coming out of high school. Yeah, I definitely think it, it would have affected it. You know, I mean, obviously football is the main goal. It's the main objective to, you know, be on a good team and be in the best position possible for football. But if you can get both, you know, living in Miami, I can get both playing for, you know, a great university. And plus also capitalize on my name. Um, it definitely would have affected, you know, my college decision. Omar, are you worried at all, big picture, that this might uh, – help bigger schools more because they have more money, bigger boosters, and more of these endorsement type deals to attract the bigger and better athletes. 
No, I don't. University of Miami is an 8,000 person school in Coral Gables. I think this sort of ushers in a new level of entrepreneurship. Um, I think it's going to take hustle. I think there's going to be some uncertainty that we have to figure out. But at the end of the day, being a business person, uh, it's all about uncertainty. So I think um, this is what's deserved. This is what's right. I believe the student athlete will now be able to carry their own destiny and uh, be able to learn about business and be able to sort of apply uh, these business principles that they're learning about in school in the real world. Mm. Eric, what are you going to do with all that money? Save it. I don't, <laughs> really? I don't plan on saving it. Yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, just wanna, I think I'm going to save the majority of it. I'm not a big spender, so that's, that's that. Well, you know you're going to have to pick up the tab when you go out with your buddies. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see your you while we have you. There it is. All right, yes, De'Ara King, quarterback for the University of Miami, and Omar Suleiman, the CEO of College Hunks Hauling Junk. It's great to have you both. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. The Free Britney movement has a few new followers. How lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are now weighing in on this. And we will head back to Surfside, Florida. President Biden visited the collapsed condo site today as rescuers resume their search for the missing. Megan McCain, soon to be the former co-host of The View, announced today she will be leaving the show at the end of the season, citing a number of reasons. And for more on all of that, Ashley Ketz joins us now, including, I'm sure, the, the spending more time with my family. You know, that is a theme this year, isn't it, right. Joe? A lot of us have had to think about and reflect over the past year with the pandemic, and that's something that Megan uh, cited in her reason for leaving the show. Listen to what she told her coworkers. It kind of came as a surprise to not only them, but all of the viewers. Mm. I am just going to rip the Band-Aid off. I am here to tell all of you, my wonderful co-hosts and the viewers at home, that this is going to be my last season here at The View. I will be here through the end of July to finish out the season with all of you, which I am grateful for. This was not an easy decision. It took a lot of thought and counsel and prayer. Hmm. And it was a bumpy four se or last four years for her. You know, we saw a lot of these conflicts, both on and off the set, right. Joe, a lot of them going viral. And uh, those are the clips that we really remember from her tenure on The View. But it was interesting because everybody was cordial when she announced that, that she would be leaving. All of her co-hosts just were quick to praise her and, and really just shower her with a lot of love today. That show gets a lot of attention because they are so real. I mean, that conversation, is about as real as it gets, and it, it does lead to some contentious conversations. And I guess um, in some cases, I know with uh, the, the with the last host who left as well, surrounded by controversy. I used to watch the show in the beginning of the, of the show when it started, and it was fun to watch because people really spoke their minds. And I think after a while, four years, it would be, I'm sure, exhausting. Yeah, and Megan was one of those. She was pretty outspoken in her right. views on The View and also to be on a panel of all women. You know, this is a show that's been around um, about 25 years now, Joe, but we've seen the hosts come and go. I think it'll be interesting to see the type of voice they put in her spot. Right. And we still don't know who will be her replacement yet. Sharon Osbourne was the name I was trying to come up with. Yes. Right? Okay. There all have right. been a lot of different views right. over the years that we've heard from. Moving forward. Ashley Katz, good to see you. Thank you. We're going to stay now in the world of entertainment. Another celebrity story that shocked a lot of people yesterday. Bill Cosby released from prison after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his sexual assault conviction, meaning he served basically three years of what could have been a 10-year sentence, which was handed down back in 2018. Joining me now, criminal justice attorney Mark Iglarsh. Mark, it's good to see you again. We talked about Brittany the last time we were together, and we'll do that in just a minute, but let's start here with Cosby. There's been a lot of fallout in Hollywood over this. Yesterday, most of the talk centered around the legal aspects of it, but the reaction today has sort of brought it all back to the, the Me Too movement. Well, let's just make something extremely clear. He was not found innocent, no matter how his lawyers want to spin it. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land in Pennsylvania, found that a deal is a deal. Meaning the prosecutor said, hey, Cosby, we don't have enough. We're not going to go forward criminally. Mm -hmm. So now when you go into that room to give your deposition in a civil case, 
You have to answer everything truthfully because you can't invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination because you can't harm yourself. We drop charges. Mm -hmm. And then he made that statement about quaaludes being used to seduce women. And that's part of the reason why they got a conviction. Right. They used it. Sure. So Cosby went on a radio show this morning, Mark. It was his first public interview and maintained his innocence. Here's a clip of that. This is not just a black thing. Mm. This is for all the people who have been imprisoned wrongfully, regardless of race, color, or creed. So, Mark, to your point there, before we, we played that little clip, is I think the legal aspect of it. And the problem I think a lot of people are having is this is a, it's hard to unring this bell, right? It is. Here's the problem, okay? Factually, if you have a pulse and you're a reasonable human being, you know that he raped women, regardless of the fact that legally he's presumed to be innocent. Factually, he is not. So people are having a very difficult time with it, calling it a technicality. But let me just tell you, if this was your family member, this is how you have to think about it, okay, from a legal perspective. And somehow a promise was made to you or one of your loved ones, and a prosecutor then 10 years later said, you know what? I'm not going to uphold that promise. Too bad. You would say, well, well, that's a violation of my due process rights, hmm. which is exactly what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court held. This sort of came out of the blue, Mark. What, what do you think happens from here? How does this impact maybe futures, uh, future victims either deciding to or not to come forward? That's what concerns me the most. It's already been a problem for decades going against people who commit these abhorrent acts and even worse against the rich and powerful. Now, when they finally get justice and that gets taken away from them, I absolutely believe that that's going to have a chilling effect on future victims, unfortunately. All right, let's shift to Brittany. Uh, I mentioned the last time we talked, you thought that the judge might agree to some changes here. What happened in the end? Well, you don't get what you don't ask for. People wanted to free Brittany, but that wasn't what the petition requested. You know, she was asking to end the conservatorship completely. That's like going into McDonald's and asking for a filet mignon. It ain't on the menu, Britt. So the issue was, is her father capable of continuing to look out for her best interest? And she didn't even discuss that really in detail. The issue should have been, dad's not looking out for me. The numbers aren't looking good. Although maybe the numbers were looking good. And the judge said, you know what? I'm not finding that he should go. So you're right. I was just going to say, is that what we take away from this in the end, despite the public outcry to free Brittany? The, the judge clearly said it's not a good idea right now. Well, yes, the judge is making a finding that she still cannot handle her own finances. She can't handle her own person. And furthermore, that I guess the numbers, if you take a chart of her earnings, they seem to point in a very positive direction. And Brittany and her lawyers probably failed to show to the judge that it was necessary in spite of her hatred for him and in spite of his gross conflict of interest. I mean, I'm just amazed that a guy who's supposed to be looking after her finances takes a piece from it. To me, that is a gross conflict of interest, but the judge was okay with it. Well, one of the co-conservatives, though, has reportedly tried to pull out of this deal because Brittany wants out. This thing is getting a little bit messy. How does that work from here moving forward? And I guess that was my question to you the last time. Why not try to find a conservator that Brittany's happy with instead of her father? Agreed. Wouldn't that be just great? But the way that this works is things are already in motion, right? You can't just change things because the public wants it or because it makes sense. A lot of times things don't make sense in the legal arena. Things have to be petitioned. People have to make requests. And in the future, moving forward, if that conservatorship wants out, if that person wants out, they would file something. And then perhaps the judge would consider replacing them with a suitable replacement. So, so can she try to file again in six months or a year? Where do we go from here? Yes. She can, she should, she's made clear what her intentions are. It's like she's caught in a hell, really. In other words, she's not capable of making decisions, but she needs to make a decision to be able to get the judge mm. to change this nightmare that she's in, right? All right? So she's mentioned it, her lawyers should file something on her behalf and let's at least air it out and find out what we don't know. What's in those reports that are causing the judge to have concerns about her well-being? Sounds to me like she should hire you. Thank you. Speak to Mark. <laughs> Mom, I'll take 10% off. Baby Criminal yeah. justice attorney Mark Iglarsh. It's good to see you again. You'll check out his website at speaktomark.com, as he just mentioned. We'll get you another plug there. Thank you, sir. 
Thanks, Joe. Take care. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney says she will serve on the House Commission to investigate January 6th how the newly formed committee could create greater divide within the GOP. And we'll head live to Surfside, Florida, as the search for survivors there continues. The search for survivors is now back on in Surfside after it was halted over structural concerns about the remaining part of that building possibly coming down. This all comes after President Biden spent the day meeting with families of victims there in Surfside. News Nation's Ruta Bay Shabazi is live there, has been all week, and she joins us now with the latest on what happened today. Ruta Bay? Joe, it's been a very eventful day. Around uh, 4 in the morning last night, they called off the search. They said it was just too dangerous for the search and rescue crews, that they didn't want to put them in peril because they saw movement. They saw the cracks widening, and they saw movement of about a foot. They have electronic monitors that keep an eye on those things, and so they called it off. They halted it uh, temporarily. Then Biden came this morning. He met with families. He met with the first responders, and he shared his personal stories of grief. He kind of empathized with them. He also uh, met privately with those families and he met with the public officials at the local and state level. They all talked about cooperation and how they're all working together. President Biden pledging uh, full support from the federal government, 100 percent of the cost for 30 days. But he also said that after meeting the families, it's important, of course, to hold on for hope. But he did say that hope was dimin diminishing. I think that there's we should move on, continue to try to recover the bodies. In the meantime, that's why NISTA and others are determining whether or not it's safe to send the first responders back. When they'd ask me about this, I'd point out that the last thing they would want and we would want is in the process of trying to recover and the possibility, there's still a possibility, someone could be alive, someone could still be breathing, someone could be there that the last thing you want to have happen is have that building collapse and kill 10, 20, 30, 50 firefighters or wound them or, uh, or uh, first responders. So that's what he said earlier. After that, at around 4.45, they did resume the search. So they are back on top of that pile. And this is the first time in state history that every search and rescue unit has been mobilized outside of a hurricane, Joe. And now, on top of that, Tropical Storm Elsa does have South Florida in its cone. So we just heard from the press conference a little while ago, emergency management officials were there. They were talking about uh, how to prepare for a hurricane. This is what we hear in South Florida every year. But but if you take that coupled with this massive effort that's going on and everything that they've had to deal with, oh, fires and yeah. wind and rain already, uh, it's just a, a Herculean effort, Joe. Yeah, and it's the last thing they need, for sure. Ruta Bay Shabazi, another busy day in Surfside. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to Joseph Walks. He's a community activist who's been on the ground in Surfside helping the families of the victims, but flew back to New York to help lead a prayer for the victims. Joseph, thank you for joining us and spending some time. Tell us a little bit about what that's all about, why you're there in New York. Right, I flew in late last night to uh, go to the rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson, the Chabad leader who passed away in 1994, just for some blessings for our community. Uh, we, Our community in the last week, the world's attention has been drawn to it. But I've been living in Surfside for the last 12 and a half years. And it's one of the most special communities you see in the world. The world is actually seeing this paradise. It was a very quiet town. It's a place that we all know each other. There's not a person that in Surfside that doesn't know a single family in the Champlain. Everyone knows everyone. Wow. I didn't know you'd been there for 12 and a half years, Joseph. Give us an idea then what it's been like for you uh, for the past week. So like every resident, we just stopped what we were doing, freezed, stopped our work, went down to the families, went to the reunification center where we still, many of us are hoping and many praying and there's the families there in different sections. There's so much going on. We've got rescue workers, we've got first responders, we've got national, we've got federal, we've got families, families that are still waiting, families that are burying, families that have no idea. I've got a boy that comes to my house every single day 
just to cook food because he's staying in a hotel, wow. but he doesn't want to just eat the bamba that we're serving him. He's very appreciative to the community. The community has come together. This is what our community is all about. It took this for me to realize it, but I always knew we were a special community. Well, you're a great spokesman for that community and also for Surfside as well. Community activist Joseph Wax, thank you so much. We wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. From Miami to D.C. now, Representative Liz Cheney says she will serve on the House Commission to investigate January 6th. Joe Khalil live in D.C. with more on her decision and more that's happening in the nation's capital. Hi, Joe. Hey, Joe, yeah, this is probably the most decisive break that we've seen so far with Congresswoman Liz Cheney and her party. We know that Republican leaders warned all their members do not accept any Democrats' invitation to be on this January 6th committee. Uh, Liz Cheney not only outright defied her party leaders, she not only accepted Speaker Pelosi's invitation to be on that committee and serve on it, but almost immediately she put out a statement. We can put some of it on the screen here uh, where she says she is proud to be on this committee to be investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Now, you know, we know that uh, she says she took an oath to the Constitution. She says being on this committee allows her to serve that oath, and it puts her above political partisanship. We also know that Liz Cheney's been a really outspoken critic of former President Trump for his role in the Capitol riot, and she's also been uh, one of, you know, only a handful, Joe, of Republicans who really consistently supported the idea of having a committee to investigate January 6th. A Republican House leader, Kevin McCarthy, heard all of this today, obviously not happy about it. Here's what he said this morning. It would be shocking to me for anybody from a party on the other side to come and want to accept a position a Democrat from me, and it'd be shocking to me to have a Republican to go to a Speaker Pelosi, of all people. And there was reporting that McCarthy told Republicans if they hop on this committee, they could lose their committee assignments uh, in other places. He hasn't ruled out removing Cheney at this point from her post. She serves on the Armed Services Committee because of this decision. We also know that she lost her spot in the leadership among House Republicans because uh, of being so outspoken about former President Trump, Joe, something that we saw uh, just uh, a few months ago. So will Republicans then round out the rest of this committee, Joe? Well, they have five spots. Right. We know who the Democrats have chosen. We know that Republicans so far have not uh, made public who they want, might choose. Some Republicans have publicly said they don't think Kevin McCarthy uh, will choose anybody. And if that happens, we heard Speaker Pelosi earlier this morning say that Democrats will just move forward hmm. without Republicans if they delay. Uh, she says they have a quorum, meaning they have enough members to do this investigation on their own. Quickly, Joe, before you go, I know Congress has suddenly taken some interest in the Britney Spears concern conservatorship case. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the case sort of blew up this week when uh, after Britney Spears testified in court. So we heard that Matt Gates actually sent a letter, a uh, congressman Matt Gates, to Britney Spears, inviting her to come testify here on Capitol Hill and tell her story, maybe become the face uh, of the reforms that need to happen with uh, the conservatorship system. And by the way, we also heard that uh, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bob Casey, both Democrats, are also interested in hearing about some abuses and hearing about Britney. Britney Spears case specifically, Joe. So uh, when you talk about, you know, what could potentially unite uh, Matt Gates with uh, an Elizabeth Warren, it's Britney Spears' story. Another busy day on the Hill. Joe Khalil, thanks for the recap. Pfizer thanks, seeks approval of its COVID vaccine in children as young as five years old. But what about the side effects? We'll ask a doctor next. More than 155 million Americans are now fully vaccinated from COVID-19. Pfizer is planning to request now emergency approval for children ages 5 to 11. But some medical experts say more research should be done on these vaccines, citing various health concerns. Joining me now, Dr. Robert Malone. He's been involved in mRNA technology for years now that's being used in some of these vaccines. Doctor, I feel obligated, to, I guess, first to thank you for your work in this mRNA technology because it's responsible for many of the vaccines we're using right now. But with your voice so important in this discussion, we have to ask what it is you're concerned about. Hi, Joe. Um, in terms of children, which is what we're talking about, right, there are 
There are known side effects. This was discussed at the CDC recently. These are uh, problems with the heart and heart inflammation. And uh, those are occurring at, at a level that it, uh, may make it uh, raise concern about whether or not we really need to treat with uh, these vaccines in the children and adolescent populations because the risk of actually developing severe COVID disease is so low. So what, what is the possibility? Do we know yet? What, what are the, the risks for, for myocarditis or any of the other the side effects that you're concerned about? And what are the age cutoffs you're talking about too? They're a tiny fraction of a percent. And uh, the problem is that, that we also have a tiny fraction of a percent of risk for children becoming hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. The AIDS cohort, the age cohorts range from infants, babies, all the way through young adults is the, is the facts. Those are all at fairly low risk, but particularly uh, infants through age 18. What's so, a young adult, um, up to what? Yeah, 18 at least, probably about 25 is, is before you get to significant change. But the truth is that the severe incidence of COVID is really dominated in the elderly cohort. Right. So you don't have a problem with the vaccine, obviously, right? I mean, that's what we said. It's, it's just these, the, the younger folks you're worried about. The, the, the technical term is the risk-benefit ratio. Sure. And whether or not it makes a lot of sense to treat a certain number of children when, uh, when they might res uh, develop some cardiac problems. I'm trying to be careful here and not overstate things. Right. Uh, and yet their risk of being hospitalized is trivial. At, at this and point, this no one's... A lot of, this has a lot of mothers pretty upset right now. Right, and, and no one's forcing anyone to get it. It's just something you think parents should think about before they do this. Before we let you go, I, w I do want to get you on the fact that you had a, a YouTube removed, a video that you were a part of, and then some of your content on LinkedIn as well was also pulled down. Why was that? What was so controversial that they pulled it down? Actually, my entire LinkedIn account has been wiped. And uh, the uh, reason why the Brett uh, video that you're talking about was pulled was because one of the participants spoke a lot about ivermectin. I wasn't that person, uh, but that was the reason why. That's a therapeutic, that right? Not the, yeah, it's a therapeutic or a prophylactic. For the LinkedIn account, it was pulled for three reasons. Number one, I had stated some scientific facts that were inconvenient, I guess, uh, but they were in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, they, I had raised concerns about censoring, and that makes that's kind of interesting to be censored sure. for talking about censoring. And I had posted a copy of the recent Wall Street Journal editorial that raised some concerns about vaccine safety. So those three things were enough to get me wiped off of LinkedIn. Right. Well, we, I know I want to just point out the fact that you were talking about spike protein toxicity. And for those who are interested in that, um, you can read more about the debate online. You will find it other than on uh, the doctor's LinkedIn page if you want to know more about that. Dr. Robert Malone, mRNA vaccine inventor, we appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Some breaking news this hour. The Justice Department has announced it will halt all federal executions as it conducts a review of its policies and procedures. In a statement, Attorney General Merrick Garland said the Department of Justice must ensure that everyone in the federal criminal system is not only afforded the rights guaranteed by the Constitution and laws of the U.S., but is also treated fairly and humanely. That obligation has special force in capital cases. The U.S. economy continues to recover from the pandemic, but as businesses struggle to find workers, is a slowdown coming. Economic news now. Layoffs plunging to a 21-year low in June, and the number of Americans applying for jobless benefits at a record low, at least for the pandemic anyway. Mitch Rochelle, founder of Macro Trends Advisors, joins us now. First off, still a lot of jobs available, Mitch, but is America back to work? Well, they're trying to, uh, or at least uh, the employment side of it is trying to get people back. Uh, we do have uh, the good news that some governors across the, the country are uh, wiping away that additional $300 a week. That seems to have worked. You're seeing some states in which they took that benefit away. The unemployment rate in those states fall, fell greater than the states that have left it. So uh, maybe we'll get people back to work. But no matter what business you go to, you seem to see a help wanted sign. And I just can't drive the 
uh, nine plus million job openings with the seven million people who are still out of work since February of 2020. Speaking of which, we get jobs numbers tomorrow. What are you expecting? I haven't heard much about uh, predictions on this one. Well, my prediction is, you know, a couple of months ago, the number was underwhelming. Last month, it was just under, I think it was 599,000. Uh, some estimates are as high as 800,000. All good news. But to get into the weeds a little bit, I don't really look at that number, the number of jobs or the unemployment rate. Uh, to get a little wonky, I look at the workforce participation rate, which is the measure of how many people are in the workforce, because I want to see us close that gap and get uh, those 9.6 right. million job openings, getting people into them. Let's talk about some money too, Mitch, with job gains and then not enough hiring. As you mentioned, you do get rising wages. We're hearing about people who are getting pretty steep bonuses for coming to work that companies are offering, which is in the end, all good news for the people who are looking for these jobs. The, unfortunately, Joe, we're in this sort of vicious cycle of inflation from wages. So wages are going to start going up because of the fact that employers are going to have to give incentives like higher hourly wages or bonuses to get people to come work or get back to work. Uh, and then you start having more inflation in the supply chain because we're paying people more. So um, I think rising wages are always a good thing. The ch question is, will they keep up with inflation? Uh, because right now wages are you know rising at half the rate of inflation. And if prices keep going up because of wages, again, you get yourself into this vicious cycle. Right. There you go. You can see the numbers right there. At this point, it's outpacing the wages, which uh, we'll keep yeah. an eye on for sure. Meantime, Americans are seeing the economy in different ways, Mitch, and we're seeing it not necessarily between the employed and unemployed. It's more of a, a partisan issue between Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, and, and I think the problem there is we're in this inflationary period because we've sort of overstimulated the economy. Uh, I think Republicans feel like that last round of stimulus was something we didn't need, the direct payments or the extra $300 a month. That's why you didn't get a single Republican vote for it. And because we've overstimulated the economy, it's starting to run hot. We're starting to see inflation. We're starting to see GDP growth is coming in as a high number. And that's the thing that uh, economists worry about, the Fed worries about. So that's why it's become a partisan issue. One more thing before we let you go, Mitch, uh, the housing market's white hot. Do you think this can sustain or do you, are you worried we're out of bubble here? Yeah, this is kind of Econ 101. That is supply and demand. There's very little uh, supply of homes on the market. There's very, very strong demand. That's what's driving up prices. The good news there is I think uh, would-be buyers are starting to say too rich for my blood. That could be a good barometer. So the free right. market may in fact control the housing market from overheating and getting into a bubble. We remember that from about 12 years ago. No doubt. Mitch Rochelle, founding partner of Macro Trends Advisors. Good to see you as always. You bet, Joe. Thanks. That's our time for now. Much more on the 4th of July travel weekend ahead and the situation in Surfside, Florida, next on Prime.